Oh, well, here we are. It's uh, Friday, the 19th of July, 2013. It's about uh, probably 95, 98 degrees out right now. Rather warm. Um, it's about 11:17 in the morning. The sun is just about directly over my head, so it's very hot right now. And to make matters worse. We got construction going on down here in the woods. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Some big truck, sounds almost like a cement truck or something, I don't know. But uh, it's making all kinds of rackets, so hopefully you can hear me all right. Microphone's right there, so hopefully it's, you know, turning out okay. But I wanna talk today about the sin of unforgiveness, okay? How you should forgive people as a Christian, people that have wronged you why and and how often and things why you should forgive how often you should forgive okay so let's turn here in your bible to genesis genesis chapter 49 now if you follow this ministry you know that one of the ways that i often define words is by the bible method king james bible method of the law of first mention okay the first time a word shows up in your King James Bible, very often times it will be defined within the context of when it shows up. Okay? Genesis chapter 49, verse 33. It says here, And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. Okay? Jacob there um, had his sons before him, and he, he talked to them and stuff like that, and he died here in this verse. Okay, now look at chapter 50, verses 1 and 2. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father, and the physicians embalmed Israel. Okay, so Joseph here, he's you know very high up in politics there in Egypt. He's like basically the assistant to Pharaoh, and vice Pharaoh, if you will. And he has his physicians embalm Jacob, his father, who's called Israel here. If you know your Bible, Jacob is called Israel. So, as I always say, the time that's coming is the time of Jacob's trouble, which is Israel, not the church, okay? But, uh, so you see there, that Jacob dies and Joseph, his son, is mourning over him. Now jump down to verse 12 in chapter 50 there. It says here, And his sons did unto him according as he had commanded them, for his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. So Jacob says to his sons, when, you, when I die, I don't want to be buried down there in Egypt among those heathen people. You bury me back there in the land of Canaan, which is where they took him. All right, now we're going to see the thing of forgiveness coming in here. Uh, look at verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, there it is, first time it shows up, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. You know, here these brethren were, they had years and years and years before that, they had sold Joseph, their brother, into slavery. They thought they meant it to do evil, but it was actually the Lord working through that and doing good. Okay? And if you know the old, whole story there in the book of Genesis, you can understand that. Read it sometime if you don't know about it. But the point is, did Joseph do anything wrong? No. His brethren did something wrong to him, you see. His brethren were the ones that did the wrong there, but they said, forgive us for the trespass that we did to thee. See? 
Now that's what you're going to experience in life. I'm going to tell you right now, brethren, you will be wronged by people. And the sin comes when you are not willing to forgive those people. Okay? So let's continue on here. Luke chapter 11. Go to Luke chapter 11 in your New Testament. I'm going to show you how this lines up for us today as Christians. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Okay. Luke 11 verse 1 And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased one of his disciples said unto him Lord teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples and he said unto them when ye pray say our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done as in heaven so in earth give us day by day our daily bread and look at this verse 4 and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, the model prayer there, and you don't have to pray those exact words, but the point is there, you see a lot of things. Your prayer is to be with thanksgiving, and your prayer is also to be with forgiveness. Forgiveness for people that have wronged you. And if you are not willing to forgive those people, when God forgave you all those sins, eh, the Lord's not going to have as much grace for you. When you mess up, the Lord's going to be a little bit quicker to judge you, you know, because you're a very unforgiving person. See, well, that's one of those attributes of being a, a true Christian that's very difficult. It's kind of like long-suffering and patience and things. You know, when people are nasty to you, when they're bad to you, and you haven't done anything to deserve it, the attribute of a Christian, that supernatural attribute that comes in is being willing to forgive somebody that's wronged you. That's difficult. And I'm going to show you how to do that as we continue. You have to forgive me here. I'm getting sweat in my eyes, so I'm kind of having a rough time here. Maybe we'll put on a fun drive later, you know, so I can get a big building and, you know, a half a million dollar building and have it air conditioned and stuff. Or maybe just a million dollar, you know, TV studio or something like that. You know, like they would have done in the first century, of course. You know, they all had big buildings back then. <laughs> so I can't help but bring it up. You people know me. All right. What about uh, people say, well, that's in the Gospels, Brian. You know, what about instruction for a Christian today? Well, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Do we have to have a spirit of forgiveness as Christians in the church age? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. All that annoying sound down there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. Okay, it says here, so that contrary wise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, now look at this, speaking of forgiveness, there in uh, verse 10, talking about forgiving people, look at verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Did you know one of the ways that Satan can get an advantage over you is for you to not forgive people? Did you know that? It's absolutely true. If Satan can get you to a point where you are going around in bitterness and you haven't forgiven somebody that's wronged you, forgiven them, it can actually destroy your life. Something to think about there. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12.
And here's how Satan gets an advantage of you. Okay? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You know what will happen a lot of times when a Christian is wrong and they don't forgive the person who wronged them? A lot of times it will lead to a spirit of bitterness. That root of bitterness takes hold and it springs up and many are defiled. You know, right now there's a lot of weeds back here behind me and I could take one of them weeds out here, it's no big deal, but I could take one of them things and take the root and I could stick that thing into your garden somewhere, your flower pot or your flower bed there, there in front of your house. And once that root takes hold, it springs up and guess what? Now you have roots, you have that briar, that thorn all through your flower bed. And if you don't take care of that thing, that root will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. A lot of wild plants, they grow from the root. Okay, not so much from seed. They can be spread from seed. But a lot of these things, a lot of these briars, you can actually take them, bend them down to the ground, put a rock on the briar, and it'll re-root. Just from the stem of the thing, it'll re-root. And guess what happens? Well, at one point in time, these briars had to get a start someplace. And you try to yank these things out, they got a big root going down underneath and it goes to another one and it goes to another one and it goes to another one. There's a huge network of roots, of thorns, under where I'm standing. And it's almost impossible to get rid of all these briars, you know. And see, that can happen in your Christian life. You let that root of bitterness get hold of you and you don't take care of it. And pretty soon it starts to spread. And you get around other Christians and you tell them of the bad things that somebody else did to you. And that springs up and it defiles them. And then they spread it. And then they spread it. And then they spread it. And before long, guess what? Satan, that device where he got you to go and, you, and you're going and you're gossiping about people and stuff and backstabbing them and, and all that, you know? Oh, the body of Christ wouldn't do that, right? Yeah. You know, that root of bitterness spreads and it defiles many people. And I've seen that thing happen many times, you know. I've left different uh, church buildings, and instead of the people just moving on, you know, they'll, they'll spread it around. And you'll see these brothers and sisters, you know, out in public, and they won't even talk to you. People that were formerly friends won't even talk to you, won't even acknowledge your existence. Why? Because a root of bitterness took hold in their life, and they didn't forgive. And there my many are defiled. Many people that used to, used to call you a friend, now their mind is defiled and now they turn against you. Happens all the time. And guess what happens when you get into that position? The Lord can't use you. The Lord doesn't want bitter Christians. Okay? But you say, Brother Brian, I mean, I've been wronged. You know, you can turn in your Bible to Matthew 18. I've been wrong, brother. You know, I mean, really, seriously, I've been wrong. I mean, think about Joseph. You know, there he is, his own brothers fake his death and sell him into slavery to Egypt? Wow. I mean, you talk about being wronged. That's serious right there. Very, very serious. Your own family selling you into slavery. He was wrong. But he forgave. See? He moved forward. He wasn't sitting around just being bitter all the time. And they said, can you interpret a dream? Oh, I don't care. My brothers, they sold me into slavery. And it wasn't right. And oh, I just shouldn't have done that. And uh, I was just like, well, yeah, yeah. I got slaved into, sold into slavery. Whatever. Yeah, I'll interpret the dream. The Lord will give me the interpretation. And he gets moved up to the, the second to the top level position in, the, in Egypt. You know, why? He didn't hold on to bitterness. He didn't have an unforgiving spirit. So how many times should you for forgive a brother or a sister? Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? 
And, you know, knowing Peter, he probably had a brother that had sinned against him, and it was probably, you know, seven times, and Peter's ready to just, you know, rebuke the guy. <laughs> but look what Jesus says. Verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now what is seventy times seven? Four hundred ninety. So in other words, a brother is supposed to, you're just supposed to continue forgiving them up to 490 times, right? And then 491, then you can really tear into them, right? No, that's not what Jesus is trying to say. Jesus is not trying to say the number of times that you forgive somebody who's trespassed against you is 490 times and, and then it's okay. Uh-uh. That's not what Jesus is trying to say. He's trying to say not just seven times, but 70 times seven. You just keep on forgiving. You see, one of the best ways to re have revenge, take revenge against somebody, is to live well. Forgive them and move on. Somebody's wronged you? Whatever. Don't let their sin against you ruin your life and your fellowship with the Lord. Don't let that happen. Forgive them. Forgive it and forget it. Okay? Next we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6. You say, well, what if I don't forgive somebody? Well, we'll show you what happens. Matthew chapter 6. Oops. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Okay, we read here. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now look at this. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Again, like I said earlier, you know, now you got to understand when that was written, Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. The perfect sacrifice had not been made for the, 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 the sins of the world. So in a sense, all your sins are forgiven. Not in a sense. Doctrinally, all your sins today as a Christian are forgiven at Calvary. Okay? So you don't have to worry about sin in terms of, I'm going to go to hell if I sin. I've fallen out of salvation or something. No. Nonsense. What you do have to worry about is staying in fellowship with the Lord. Okay? And when you don't forgive other people, when you have a very unforgiving spirit, God's not going to have a lot of grace for your sins. He's not going to put up with a lot from you because you don't put up with a lot from other people. And I want to show you a little story here to illustrate that point. Matthew chapter 18. Turn to Matthew 18, verse 23. A lot of people have a hard time getting victory over certain sins. Do you ever think maybe it's because you have an unforgiving spirit? Maybe it's because you're judging hypocritically. You know, the Bible talks about judge not lest she be judged. You know? But you go on to read and it's talking about if you're judging somebody else when you're guilty of that sin, you're being a hypocrite. See? Don't judge hypocritically. It's perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable for you as a Christian to judge other people. Okay? He that is spiritual judgeth all things, it says there in 1 Corinthians. You can judge all things, but make sure that you have the beam removed out of your eye. Or the, the what is it? The, the, yeah, it's the beam, you know, uh, so that you can clearly see to take the mote out of your brother's eye or whatever. You know, make sure that you are not judging hypocritically. But let's look here, Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. Wow. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. 
And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their lord all that was done. Then his lord, after that he had called him, and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Again, you see it there. God's not going to have a whole lot of grace for you if you aren't willing to forgive the brethren when they wrong you. Okay, it isn't forgive the brethren when they haven't wronged you. It's forgive them when they've wronged you. You have to have forgiveness in your heart as a Christian. It'll only ruin your effectiveness for the Lord if you hold on to that bitterness. Okay? Now you say, well, boy, I don't know, Brian. How, how in the world should I do this? You know, how can I do that thing of forgiving those that have wronged me? Well, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And verse... 10, I believe it is, yeah. Philippians 3, 10 through 14. It says here that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto death. Unto his death, excuse me. You want power in your life as a Christian? Well, then you're going to have to go through some suffering. Guess what part of suffering is? People wronging you and you having to learn to forgive them. Verse 11, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm not perfect. He's saying, I have not arrived at perfection as a Christian, but I follow after that. Okay, I strive for perfection. I do my best every day. I don't just say, eh, good enough. I strive for perfection. That's what Paul's saying there. Look at verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Huh. Forgetting those things which are behind? You mean like people wronging you? Yeah. See, part of forgiveness is not that you have to make it right with that person who wronged you. No, part of forgiveness is that you just say, I forgive what, them for what they did to me, now I'm moving forward. If they want to be miserable, if they want to backbite me and stab me in the back, if they want to treat me like dirt and spread around, cast out my name as evil, okay, I got work to do for Jesus Christ. Instead of, you know, trying to see what the latest gossip is on yourself. I'm going to be talking about this in the next sermon here I'm going to be doing. This thing of people backstabbing. Instead of trying to find out who's saying what and what they're saying and living in all kinds of misery and getting bitter, just move forward. You know, I'm going to be, in the next sermon, I'm actually going to be talking about uh, this thing of King James Video Ministries and the tithe and stuff and people saying that I'm in ministry for money. And there's people on YouTube that have come out and made whole videos, whole series of videos, showing that I'm in it for the money. Now I can get bitter about that, or I can just forgive them for being stupid and saying, you know what, I'm going to move on. i got a life to live. You know, right now, there's berries all over the place. Just give me a minute. Look at that thing. See it? Wild blackberry. There's thousands of them up here right now that are ripe, ready to be picked. Now, there's fruit that's available, but the fruit isn't going to come to you. 
you have to go out and harvest the fruit yourself. You see, Jesus looked at the wheat field and he said, it's ready to be harvested, but the laborers are few. Right now, up here, these berry patches are ready to be harvested, but the laborers are few. See, spiritually, there's a lot of people out there that are ready to be harvested. They want to know the truth. They want to hear the truth. But the laborers, those that go out and pass out the tracts, those that get out and preach to the lost world, those laborers are few. There aren't that many Bible-believing Christians, King James Bible-believing Christians. Now, you can either go and be bitter. I could be on the Internet right now looking up the latest gossip and watching these videos that these little nothings have, have made about me. Or I could be up here making videos and getting it on the internet and witnessing to people online, going out in public and putting out gospel tracts and spreading the gospel wherever we go. I want to bear fruit. I want to come up to where the harvest is, to where I see the fruit is available. The fruit isn't available in the church buildings anymore. People, even modern Christians, are starting to see this building thing, this whole church building agenda is politics. They want something real. They want something genuine that's not artificial. They don't want plastic religion anymore. They want a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I can get bitter about things that people in church buildings did to me in the past, or I can move forward. I choose to move forward, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward. I'm up here to harvest some fruit. And we are going to be picking some berries when I'm done with the sermons, but uh, spiritually I'm talking about. I want to harvest spiritual fruit. And brethren, I don't know when the rapture is going to happen. I predict it come, you know, it's going to come every year, you know, because I'm anxiously awaiting for the Lord. And, you know, you say, have your predictions come true? No, most of them have failed. But, uh, you say, well, then you're a false prophet. No, because I'm supposed to look for Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm hoping he comes. I get excited when I hear people predicting when Jesus Christ is coming. But do I really know when he's coming? No, I don't know when he's coming. Nobody else does either. But the fact is, you can feel it. As a Christian, you can feel that the times are drawing to an end. You know? I mean, it'd be kind of like hearing a weather forecast that... Uh, there's going to be a horrible hurricane and all these berries up here are going to be destroyed. You know, or there's a wildfire coming or something like that. These berries are going to be all going to be destroyed within a week. Nah, I don't think I'm going to go pick any. I'll just kind of let it go. You know, because after all, going and picking berries is difficult work. I mean, you sweat, you know, and your, your arms are getting cut up and stuff from picking berries. You know, you get kind of cut up and things. and It's kind of hard to do, so... I don't think I'm going to go pick any. Well, they're going to be gone in a week. Better get busy. Know what I mean? One more place to turn to here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. This is how to keep yourself right mentally as a Christian. You want to keep this head from going off and, and getting messed up? This is how you do it right here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always, and, I, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. There's a very easy thing to remember if you want to stay right with God and you want to stay in the battle for the Lord. The three F's. Forgive, forget, and focus. Okay? Those three things will keep you on the right path. Forgive what people do to you. When people wrong you, 
forgive them. That doesn't mean that you have to go sit down and work out your differences. It doesn't mean that. It means, hey, I forgive you. What did Jesus say on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. What did Stephen say as he's being stoned to death? Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Forgive. Did that mean then that Jesus worked out his differences with the people there that were mocking him while he was dying on the cross? No. Did Stephen work it out with the scribes and Pharisees and you know, Alexandrians and things that stoned him to death? No. But you can forgive people that have wronged you without getting them to agree that they've wronged you. Because most of them aren't going to do it. The best thing that you can do when somebody's wronged you is realize they're the one that has the problem. And what they're doing is Satan is using them to try and slow you down in your work. Mm -hmm. See, right now, as I said back to my example, all around me here, these bushes are filled with raspberries. Or, excuse me, blackberries. There's some raspberries left, but mostly blackberries. Wild blackberries. And somebody, if I'm here picking these, and somebody comes up and they try to take them, and try to slow me down, the best thing I can do is just ignore that person. Just say, hey, get out of here. Okay? I got work to do. And that's what the devil is going to try to do to you as a Christian. He's going to try and send people into your life to slow you down and to slow down your labor for the Lord. That's what he wants. The devil, his greatest fear is a Christian that's doing the work of the Lord. He doesn't like that. And so the devil will go and he'll pick a bunch of dirty, reprobate Christians that God hasn't used in 30 years, a lot of times. And the devil will pick them and send them in to slow you down. And, you know, you're there preaching the Bible, you know, and you're preaching the Word and you're saying, the Bible says, you know, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, and some dirty hypocrite will come along and he'll say, oh, you use the King James Bible. Oh, well, that's was a good Bible in its day, but uh, we have more accurate translations today. And, and uh, what about 1 John 5, 7? The comma Johannium, you know. What are they trying to do? Stop you in your work? Stop you in your work from bearing fruit for the Lord? Hey, did you know that we're going to go through the tribulation? Are you prepared to survive? Oh, what, they're, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you off your work. As I've said before so many times, if you believe in Jesus Christ coming back soon, you're going to spend your time out here picking fruit. If you believe that you're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, then you better start getting ready to survive the thing without taking the mark. Because if you take the mark, you lose your salvation and, you know, big problem. How about uh, somebody coming along to you and they say, uh, where do you worship at? Well, I don't. I worship at home. Oh, really? Well, uh, you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. You need to be part of a local church. And if you don't, well, you're a rebel. You know what I've had put on me from local church pastors? I've had them say, you're not allowed to pass out tracts. I forbid you from passing out tracts. Unmarked tracks, mind you. Not even putting the name of the church building on it. Unmarked tracks. I've actually had church building pastors say, I don't want you putting them out in this area. What's he trying to do? Trying to stop me from picking fruit. Trying to stop me from laying up treasures in heaven. Why? Because he has a building and a reputation to hold on to. You know, there's all kinds of things out there that Christians are going to try to do to stop you from the work that you have before you. Don't let them stop you. Okay? Right now, there are millions and millions and millions of people, billions of people, excuse me, that are lost and on their way to hell. And you have an opportunity, as a Christian, King James Bible believer, you have absolute truth right here in the Bible. And you can take your absolute truth and you can give it to people. And you can tell them, here's how to get saved. And you can bear great fruit that way. 
That's what you need to think about. And if these reprobate Christians are coming along and trying to slow you down, and they wrong you, really genuinely wrong you, stab you in the back, gossip about you, put out videos attacking you, tearing you down, forgive them. Forgive them, forget them, and stay focused on the mission before you. There's not much time left. So, that's going to be it for now. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, for the people out there and, and even for my own life, that you'd help me to forgive those who have wronged me in the past. Just forget them, move forward. I just pray, Lord, that uh, if there's any out there that ha are holding on to some bitterness about something bad that's happened to them in the past, I pray that, Lord, that they would uh, forgive and forget and stay focused on the ministry that's before them, the work of the Lord that they have. I just thank you, Lord, for the ultimate forgiveness, which is the forgiveness of our sins. Those of us who have put our faith in you and in the finished work that you did on the cross, the blood that you shed for us to pay for our sins. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for forgiving our sins. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would really just build a passion within your people, a passion for the word, a passion for the truth, and that they would get out there and witness and put out tracks and do whatever they can in the short time that we have left, Lord, that they would think about the fruit that's ready to harvest. And Lord, I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's it. Next sermon is going to be on tithing. What does the Bible teach about tithing? And what is the financial goal of King James Video Ministries? So I'm going to answer some of the reprobates that have been attacking me because people want answers, I'll give them answers. So that's going to be it for this sermon. Thank you very much for watching.